The topic today is medication, anti-anxiety medication, and as you know, we're frequently recommending you talk to your veterinarian about anti-anxiety medication if you've been struggling with fear or aggression issues with your dog, especially if you've been struggling a while, you've tried some training and you're not getting anywhere or not making very fast progress. Now, um, I'm a trainer, I'm not a veterinarian, and I can't recommend you know, particular medications. I can't tell you what to try or what to ask your vet about. I can just tell you to go talk to your veterinarian or a veterinary behaviorist if you have one nearby, or you can help your vet connect with a veterinary behaviorist via email or phone. If you want help finding um, a, a veterinary behaviorist who can do a consult with you or your vet, uh, feel free to email us and we can help you find somebody in your area or at least someone who could consult with your veterinarian. So what I'm gonna do today is talk about um, our dog, Pancake, who's recently adopted. He's been the star of several recent episodes of our Facebook Lives. And I want you to, I wanna walk you through his journey with us thus far uh, with medication and training, of course. You never just, or you rarely just give medication. You're almost always doing some training with your dog as well. Um, but I hope you can see the differences that medication has made for him in terms of the speed of his progress. Okay, so let's get into the slides and then I have quite a bit of video for you. So should your dog be on meds? And as I said, I can't tell you. <laughs> I can't tell you that. Only your vet or veterinary behaviors can tell you that. So what I'll do today is just show you the role that meds have played in one of our dog's um, behavior change journey. So why would you ask your veterinarian about medication? If your dog is fearful, anxious, reactive, um, this can be anything from really severe fear and anxiety, a dog who can't be touched, won't leave the house, um, to a dog who you know maybe seems normal at home, but anything outside the house is just way too much for them. There are lots of reasons to talk to your veterinarian. Basically, if you think your dog is suffering, um, even if they're fine at home, if you can't get them outside the house because they're so afraid, or if you've been, you know, you can get them out and you've been making some progress, but you feel like you completely stalled out or your progress is really slow, talk to your vet. It, it, it doesn't hurt to ask. And, you know, if you try meds and you decide they're not for you or your vet decides they're not for your dog, that's okay but you'll never know if you don't try if they might have might have helped you get over a hump. I wanted to really quickly talk about where medication falls in our little framework that we frequently use to talk about behavior problems. Um, for those of you who are maybe joining us for the first time or haven't watched past videos, when we talk about changing behavior problems that arise um, from some kind of fear, so aggression, aggressive behavior, fearful behavior, we talk about um, the, whatever consequence the dog gets from the behavior, which is very often driving something scary away, the motivation to make that happen, and then the opportunity to make that happen. And we talk about these three places as places where we have the opportunity to intervene and change behavior. Um, and just to make it a little more concrete with regard to medication, uh, those of you who watched our, gr our Growling at Husband series from a couple um, weeks ago, we talked about uh, that behavior in this context and we said, okay, we think the consequence maintaining the aggression toward husband is that husband moves away. And the motivation to get that consequence, uh, the reason why Pancake is motivated to make my husband go away is because he finds him scary, right? So he's aversive to him. And when he comes close, that becomes more scary. He's very motivated to make him go away. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about motivation in this context. Now, what medication can do is shrink that motivation a little bit because stuff that it was at a level 10 scariness might only be an eight now or a seven or even a six. And that really can help you um, have much more space in the dog's life to intervene. 
what's really nice about decreasing that um, the motivation caused by fear, you know, the I want scary stuff to go away, is that now you might be able to work with other motivations the dog might have, but were previously um, really low on the list of priorities because they were so afraid and their top priority was, you know, safety, was preserving their life in their minds. So when we train behaviors we like using positive reinforcement, we're usually using motivation for food. The dog does stuff, you know, we teach them whatever, sit, hand touch, come to me, whatever behaviors we like. And the consequence they get, oops, the consequence they get is the food. So when your dog is terrified, they're not very motivated to get food. They've got bigger problems on their mind. So a scared dog, weak motivation, so difficult to train. And so when many of you, by the way, you say like, oh, my dog won't take treats outside or he's not interested in food and, I, and your dog is fearful, this is what I worry is often happening. They're still in a situation where their top motivation is survival and safety. And so you're not going to be able to get great motivation with food. It's just not important enough in that moment compared to other pressing concerns. And what medication can help us do there, because we've reduced the, um, the fear and anxiety and motivation to make scary stuff go away, now we have much stronger motivation for food and we can start to train new skills that we like. So that's kind of the, mm, the scientific or philosophical backdrop to, to what medication can do for a fearful dog. I wanted to walk you through Pancake's case, though, to give you a real-life example of the kind of difference medication can make and also the time frames you can be looking at, the trial and error, um, just, you know, something a little more grounded in real life. So Pancake, some of you have already met, is our recently adopted dog, but he was with us quite a while as a foster dog, and he came to us because um, he had been with the dog foster coordinator of our rescue for several months had shown no social behavior whatsoever toward her, was still charging and sometimes biting her when she <laughs> turned her back to move away. Um, she couldn't touch him, at least not, you know, with him being consenting to it. So there was clearly, you know, he's clearly not the normal timid dog that comes into rescue and then warms up after a little bit. So the behavior problems we were facing when Pancake came into our care were he did not tolerate human proximity at all. So he didn't want people in the same room with him, didn't want people looking at him. He could not be touched unless you were willing to force it to corner him or something. He also wouldn't eat readily um, if people were anywhere near him, which makes training with food very difficult as we talked about a second ago. So his motivation to eat when someone was in the room was not stronger than his motivation to keep himself safe. Okay, so, oh, actually, first I'm going to show you a really short video of uh, his first several, it's just the first few minutes at our house. Let's see if I can make this work. Okay. So I hope you can see this. It's kind of dark. We I put a chair with a sheet over it to give him a hiding place. Um, the foster coordinator had just dropped him off in our kitchen. I was sitting on the floor um, a distance away. My camera zoomed in here. I wasn't this close to him. But you can see how scared he is. He's hiding. He's turning his head away. His tail is tucked. I don't know if you can tell by his posture there. He would, we had tossed food. He wouldn't take it. He took, eventually there, I tossed some chicken nugget or something. Really high value. He had zero interest. I think after we'd been sitting there very quietly for an hour, he may eventually poked his head out. But, um, you know, you can see he's pretty fearful. So as soon as he came into my care, I reached out to um, a veterinarian who I know who knows a lot about behavior and also is a friend and was willing to come to the house to meet him. This was pre-COVID, obviously, uh, so that she could prescribe behavior, um, anti-anxiety medication. So we started with one, anti-anxiety medication. And throughout this presentation, I'm going to be using med, med A, B, C, that kind of stuff, since I don't, 
I don't want to, you know, falsely encourage someone to try particular medications. Um, that's for your vet to decide. So we tried this first medication. And let's take a look at what we had for that first, you know, six weeks or something. So here's Pancake in his confinement area. He is hiding in a crate. There's food there all over. Here, I'm going to toss some food. He's like, no, thank you. <laughs> I'll stay in here where it's safe. So with me that close, he was not initially willing to take any food. And this is after he's been on meds, you know, at least a couple weeks. Uh, over this first uh, four to six weeks, he did now occasionally start to be willing to eat food that was in his crate if I were nearby, as long as I wasn't there too long. Also, by the way, you may be able to see this in later videos, I was not staring at him. I was pointing my phone at him, trying to be sneaky about it while not looking at him because looking at him made him scared. So you see how worried he is, that, that furrowed brow, poor guy. So there I dropped some food outside the crate and he's like, mm, I'm not really sure. As we continued to work on this, he eventually um, started to venture out just a little bit, usually leaving the back end of his body in the crate, um, to get food that I had dropped if I was sitting very quietly in the office chair. It, the office chair was easier for whatever reason than me sitting anywhere else. So you see, he ate it, but he's, pr he's pretty uncomfortable here. Uh, we did start to make some more progress here. You can see he's out, even though I'm pretty, I'm sitting next to the uh, pen. And I dropped a treat there right inside the fence. And he was willing to come all the way out and get it. But as you can see, he wasn't comfortable with it. I hope you guys can tell that his body language is very worried there. His mouth is tightly closed. Here, right here, his brow is furrowed. Look at that worried face. Poor thing. And his tail is down and he, um, he's like, oh, I'm going back into my safe space. Thank you very much. So this was definitely progress, but, um, having a dog in my care six to eight weeks and only having this degree of, um, like willingness to be near me or eat my presence, I thought was a little bit concerning. <laughs> For a dog that, you know, at this time was a foster dog and ostensibly we were supposed to find him a home. So um, I talked to his vet and we try, we switched to a different medication. I say, okay, well, you know, he is making progress, but it's really slow. Let's try something else. So on the, the first several weeks on that new medication, we did see increased progress. This, um video, which I apologize isn't great quality because I had to take it sneakily from the kitchen. I couldn't be in the same room with him or he would stop. Is the first time I caught Pancake playing with a toy, which was very exciting. Um, it's a food toy. <laughs> I was trying to be really quiet um, and not be obvious at all. So to me, that was a very encouraging sign that after, you know, more than two months at this point, he finally engaged with a toy a cutie um but again if i walked in he would immediately run and hide so progress but you know we see i have a lot okay so here's an example of on this new medication he was out of his crate more but this was a typical response i walk into the room and he's like i will go into my crate thank you um here i'm coming in i think i dropped some treats and then i'm backing away and now he's willing he's willing to come out to get the food as i'm backing out of the room but if I stay in there most, unless I sit, um, there were some situations in which I could get him to eat when I was nearby, but they were rare. So here's kind of a highlight of this period, that first, you know, four or six weeks on the new medication. Um, and he did actually eat some food with me next to the pen, which was very exciting. But again, this was really notable. This is a rarity. Let's see what we have here. Uh, and this is just showing you his, you know, continued discomfort with eating with me in certain locations. So if I sat on the floor next to his pen, he would not take any food. So I tried backing up halfway across the room. He still wouldn't come out and take any of the food I had left in there. So even though this first, um, you know, the first medication we made a little bit of slow progress, 
but it was really slow. Okay, fine. We switch medications. The second medication, we still makes progress, and we had him play with toys, which was huge, but still um, incredibly slow progress. So, and there is no, you know, right or wrong speed, but um, at this point, you know, I'm a dog trainer, and I've been working with this dog the best way I know how. He's been in my house for months, and... Um, I still, I'm definitely nowhere near touching him. And it's pretty difficult to adopt out a dog who you can't touch. So I talked to the vet again, and he said, all right, well, we, we think maybe we got some benefit from medication B. Let's add medication C to it and see what we get. Um, and this is month three to six plus because we then had a, rather long interruption in our work together due to COVID. Um, but I have a few months of clips. I won't, I won't show you all of them, obviously. Let's see, I think it's this one. Okay, so when we added medication C, we again, um, and this is again, you know, it's not isolated from training. There's always training going on. So we can't say, oh, it was only medication or it was only training. Um, we did continue to see some progress. Here, Pancake is willing to eat out of his crate a little bit anyway, a licky mat while I'm sitting. You can just barely see me on the left of the screen sitting at my desk. So for him to stay out of his crate this long and eat while I was sitting there was um, pretty good. Uh, because he started to be more willing to eat when I was sitting at the desk, I just had to be sitting quietly at the desk and not looking at him. <laughs> Um, we were able to do a, start to do a little bit of training. So here I am throwing food just outside his um, crate to reward him, you know, coming out a little bit. And the reason, by the way, I use this pillow here as a target. Well, one is just a target for me to aim for. But also this meant that when I threw treats into the pen, they didn't make a loud noise and, and startle him. This flooring is rubber matting I put down, but it was still the treats would still make some noise and scare him. Um, we also worked on some targeting with a target stick. And some of you may have seen these. You could use anything for this. Um, you'll notice the target stick is, is entirely inside the pen and I'm not touching it. It was quite a while before he was willing to touch the target stick if I had my hand on the other end of it. Now, this was a big moment. This was, you know, maybe a month or two into adding medication C to medication B. Um, I went in to fill his water and he actually sniffed my hand. <laughs> this is a big deal. Of course, he went right back into hiding. Um, then he occasionally started to stay out of his crate when I entered the room. So there I just walked in. He looks nervous, but he didn't run directly into his crate, which was big progress. We started to do a little training to file his nails on a nail board. And we've talked about this in the group a bit, those of you who can't file dog nails. Um, I obviously couldn't file his nails or clip his nails. So here he was learning to scratch the scratch board. Another big breakthrough that happened a few months into this new medication combo was, um, was this. I think this, is, I think this is the very first time he took a treat from my hand. That was a huge deal. We were able to, and this is over many months, by the way, we were able to remove the fencing for some training. And that was um, a big deal for him because he definitely felt, I shouldn't say he felt, I my projection is that he felt safer with the fencing up because um, it had a sheet on it and he could kind of hide behind it. But bottom line is that he did more hiding when the fence wasn't there. So for him to come out and do training without the fence there was a, was big progress. Then, this, is, this was the most exciting thing to me during this period, he started to occasionally seem happy, <laughs> happy when I was around. So here, you'll see a little bit of tail wag, and then he thinks better of it and runs back into his crate. Um, and this was a morning I walked in, probably, to, I don't know, it was my office, so um, this is the first time I saw his, what we called his propeller tail, or his helicopter tail. <laughs> Um, and it was so exciting. Now this was, I don't know, at least six months into having him. All right. So on, on medication B and C, I thought, okay, we're making pretty good progress. 
Um, it's slow, but he's not a you know a normal dog. He clearly has lacked socialization. Um, this is probably as good as it's going to get. And I was beginning to realize at this point we we're probably going to keep this dog. And you know maybe a couple years from now I might be able to pet him was my thought. So okay, onward. Then uh, COVID hit and we moved um, temporarily and left him at the in the house he was comfortable with, with a caretaker he knew. Um, like many of, well, like all of us, we didn't really know how long the whole COVID lockdown thing was going to last. And we didn't want to move him to a location he was unfamiliar with that had not as ideal of a setup. We knew it would stress him out. But eventually we realized that this was going to be long. So it wasn't, although it wasn't until December of 2020 that we decided to move him up um, to this other house. So um, I had never had this dog in a car before and I was pretty worried about it. It was a couple hour drive to the other house. So I consulted with his veterinarian. She added a couple of more kind of short acting um, anti-anxiety medications for the car ride on top of uh, meds B and C that he was already taking. And off we went. The car ride actually went okay. Well, from my point of view, it went okay. He was quiet. He may have been terrified the entire time, but he didn't scream or bark or anything. Um, and something we noticed, so the, the vet said, go ahead and continue to give him those extra meds, those extra anti-anxiety meds, uh, D and E, we're calling them, for the, at least a few days after you get up to the other house because he's going to be pretty overwhelmed. Nothing will be familiar. So we did that. And I could not believe how well he did. His skittishness, sort of his um, startle reflex, his desire to hide was l significantly lower than it had been at the first house where he was familiar. And so I asked the vet, I said, this is crazy, but is this something we can keep him on long term? Because it's he's like doing really well. And they said, well, um, you know, these two, D and E, aren't really meant for, or E at least, no, D, sorry, got my lettering mixed up. One of them was not really meant for daily use, but let's go with um, something in the same class, a similar medication that's more long acting. Um, and also uh, let me consult with a veterinary behaviorist. So in, consul in consultation with a veterinary behaviorist, our vet um, kept him on meds B and C, which he'd been on for many months. We kept E, which we had used for the transport and we added F and G. So now five meds, um, a combination suggested by a veterinary behaviorist. Oops. All right, so now what I'm going to show you is um, a very condensed overview of his progress since he has been on this new cocktail. So this is in January after he had been in this house uh, with us for a couple weeks. So I don't know if it's obvious to you based on the videos you just watched what a big deal this is that I was sitting on the floor and he walked into the room by himself looking for treats. You can see he's still a little hesitant but he is eating food and moving around. little tail wag even. Uh, you can see here, he actually came all the way up to me. This is right around New, um, New Year's, I think, and took whipped cream <laughs> from my finger. Now you can see his face is really tense. His, it's hard to tell, his eyes are dark, but it looks like his pupils might be dilated. He's leaning forward to get the whipped cream without walking too close to me. But still, that was a huge deal. Later in January, now he's choosing to hang out closer to me, even lying down near me. I'm obviously sitting still and being as minimally scary as possible. So this is the first few weeks on this new cocktail. We also had the first of him jumping up onto a sofa, which was a big deal. Um, anyone who has a dog who has been this shut down and scared, you celebrate every single one of these victories. 
And this is all in a span of weeks. All right, here we are in February. He's doing so well, I've decided to start um, introducing a leash to him. So here he's just nose targeting a leash. And look how comfortable he is lying next to me. It's crazy. Then later in February, I'm able to leash him. And later in February still, I'm able to train him to have a harness put on. And this is the dog, right, who wouldn't eat if I was in the room with him or sitting too close or looking at him too directly. Um, one of the biggest um, things to celebrate in my mind, I mean, we all love dogs, right? We want to cuddle them and touch them. And when you have a dog who's afraid of you, it's heartbreaking. So I've at this point, February, this dog has been technically in our care for well over a year, maybe a year and a half, although a big chunk of that we weren't living with him due to COVID. Um, so in February, for the very first time, he solicited petting. Um, I ran out of time this morning <laughs> to, to put together his March achievements, but... Um, but I hope it's clear from this how quickly he has made progress in just a few weeks from uh, switching what to what for him is a really effective combination of medications. Um, the next few clips are kind of for fun, but also something, again, I really celebrate with a fearful dog, which is playfulness and mischief. So here, um, I wasn't purposely filming this, I was on a Nest Cam. I'm sitting there with my morning coffee um, and he's just like making trouble. He's trying to steal my breakfast. <laughs> He's like, oh, I'll come over here and get it. Nope. Um, so to have a dog who like wants to make trouble like that is pretty exciting. And then just a couple of clips of him. Now we're seeing, look at this playfulness. And it's right in front of us too. I don't have to hide in another room to see him play with a toy. <laughs> so we're really starting to see some of his silly personality come out. This was just yesterday, I think. He's <laughs> acting like a crazy. All right. So um, we are doing ongoing um, dose adjustments of some different medications because um, he has, you know, he still struggles sometimes with my husband in certain situations. He does not like me to leave the house, which you know, isn't that big of a problem right now, but is still a little constraining. Um, he doesn't always sleep well through the night. So there are things we're still working on, lots of things every day. So we, we're constantly in consultation with our veterinarian about this, about, uh, you know, should we try to switch the timing of this med? What, can this go up? Should we try to decrease this? Um, but uh, we're kind of fine tuning right now and it's a little bit less of, um, big change like we had uh, several weeks ago. Okay, so you remember we started out with a dog who would not tolerate human proximity, couldn't be touched, wouldn't eat readily if someone was in the same room, and he made small gains in these areas in the first six months he was with us on a couple, we tried a couple different medications, but you know, progress was really slow. In the last two months, on this new combination of medications, he is seeking out human proximity. Like I can't go to the bathroom without him, actually. He likes to follow me to the bathroom. Um, he couldn't be touched. And now he, does, he doesn't He does always want to be touched, but he does ask for penning sometimes. And I can put his leash on, I can put his harness on. I'm working on um, picking him up, which is I never would have dreamed of a year ago. Um, he wouldn't eat if someone is in the same room, and now he will literally steal food from your plate that you're holding in your hand trying to eat your dinner from. <laughs> so, you know, why? Why could meds help so much? You remember we talked about meds can really, anti-anxiety meds, and the right ones for your dog, um, decrease the motivation to make scary stuff go away, and then other motivations can shine through. The motivations that we want our dogs to to have to be motivated by things like attention, petting, food, the good stuff in life, instead of being motivated by uh, motivated by avoiding bad stuff in life or to avoid bad stuff. So I hope that this um, this little case study showing Pancake's journey has 
encourage you if you haven't already to talk to your veterinarian about whether medication could help your dog. And if you've already tried some medication and you feel like it's not working or you're not seeing much progress, you can see that um, there's a lot of trial and error sometimes to find the right medication. But with time and patience and consulting with your vet, you can sometimes really find um, just the right medication or combination of medications to, to help your dog to make faster progress. Michelle says, our dog is on, on calm, calm because he's scared of going out but doesn't seem to be working. Yeah, so Michelle, if your dog's been on the medication for several weeks and you don't think you're seeing any change in behavior, I would go back to your veterinarian and, and talk to them about whether there's something different you can try. Um, and if you're working with your primary vet, you know, they may want to consult with a veterinary behaviorist. That's really their area of expertise. So I would, I would consider that for sure. The first medication we tried with Pancake also didn't, you know, didn't, definitely didn't make any dramatic difference. Nadine says, is this also something that could be used for dog reactivity? Absolutely. Um, there are quite a few people who, um, a clients of ours whose reactive dogs have been greatly helped by medication. Um, often you don't know what's motivating your dog's reactivity, but especially if you think that their lunging and barking behavior is... Um, sort of the purpose of it is to make stuff go away, stuff that they don't like, like other dogs or strangers, um, then they're especially I would think that medication could have a positive impact. Um, but one thing I really wanted everyone to get from this is that, well, one, that meds can help a lot, but also don't give up if the first thing you try doesn't work or doesn't work very well or you don't see much of a impact. I mean, we, we, we really stumbled upon, you know, this class of medications Pancake is on now just because we tried something for a car ride. So, um, and there's really a lot of variety. There's a lot of different stuff your, your vet could recommend or a veterinary behaviorist. So, you know, trying one or two things, um, it's discouraging when you don't see a big effect. But if you have a really fearful or aggressive or reactive dog, um, I'd really encourage you not to give up. Keep working with your vet. You know, get a consult. Ideally, especially if you tried a couple meds and, it, and it's not working and you haven't already consulted with a veterinary behaviorist, definitely consult with one. Um, they're going to have a, just a greater knowledge of these medications than a regular uh, a general practice vet or a vet with a different area of specialty. Nadine says, even for a younger puppy, he only lunges, went out with the rest of the pack. Solo encounters, he's fearful, but will warm up and play after a while. Nadine, I would probably, if you can, and you can email us if you don't know about whether you have anything in your area, but I would consult with a veterinary behaviorist about that. Um, the veterinary behaviorist that I have um, both consulted with and heard speak often do encourage medications for fearful puppies even quite young puppies like eight weeks i've even heard medication be be recommended for so i don't think the age is a you know rules out meds for your puppy um personally so my my girl juno was kind of like this at that age and i i wish i had consulted with our local veterinary behaviorist sooner eventually she did end up on meds at a year old or so but we both suffered a lot in the meantime. <laughs> but, you know, I would say consult with a veterinary behaviorist if you can. Um, if you're not working with a really good trainer, um, that can also be helpful. But usually the veterinary behaviorist will ask for video of your dog's behavior so they can get an idea of what's going on. Here, let me. Okay, what, um... Here, let me go back to my face. Um, okay, Nadine, go ahead and email us at admin at dogkindtraining.com and let us know where you're located. And we'll try to find, um, send you um, info for who's the closest veterinary behaviors to you. If there's nobody nearby at all, many veterinary behaviors will do phone consults with your vet. So um, either way, you can still take advantage of their expertise. 